Hello everybody, it's me, Remy the Comic Book Poser, and I want to welcome you to another episode of Enter the Poserverse. Uh, and today, you know, like this week, I've tried a bunch of new things in terms of, of new segments and whatnot, and I've got yet something new uh, that I'm, I'm trying again today. Uh, I've mentioned it once or twice on the blog, but not really a lot on here. Uh, for the past couple of months, I've been part of the Chops Chop Shop podcast uh, over at Chops Comics, which is my LCS here in Lawrence, Kansas. And with with COVID happening, it's been functionally hard for the way that we do our podcast to function, right? We talk about the books that are coming out this week, any other recommendations, any you know, kind of low key news that we've discovered in the days leading up to the podcast. Uh, but with a shift in distribution models with the, the store being shut down and there being no new books, we really couldn't do, you know, the things that we would normally do every Tuesday or Wednesday night. And even as, you know, COVID restrictions begin to relax here in, in Kansas, uh, we're still all kind of mutually afraid of getting each other sick or each other's families, families sick. Uh, so out of caution, I think Jason said that, you know, the, the podcast will be on hiatus until July. So I wanted to try something new, find somebody else to talk to uh, about comics, right? Because I'm aware that my streams are less than exciting because it's just one dude ranting uh, about nothing. So in, in terms of trying to get, you know, to understand more of the community and folks like that around me, I've been interviewing people on the blog. I've interviewed uh, folks who are fan content creators, people like Lost in Comics, the, the Comic Burrito Show, uh, Wes Greer over at Comics the Gathering, uh, people who are massive collectors who work at a comic shop like Peter Smart from Peter's Comic Corner, uh, and even comic fans that are talented in a different way, like Isaac uh, over at Pixar Nerd Studios. Uh, I've been lucky enough to interview a couple of artists or authors as well, uh, but it's always been in kind of this cold Q&A format on, on the blog, right? That I send them a Google Doc, and then they type their answers, and I try and make it, you know, interesting uh, to read. So I wanted to try and talk to someone new uh, and in person today, and I decided that, you know, a great opportunity presented itself to me uh, when I read a new digital graphic novel on comiXology called Violets, and the, the person who I'm going to be talking to today is not just some other fan of comics or a graphic novel itself, uh, but, you know, I will be getting to interview uh, Sabir Prasada, the uh, writer of, of Violet. So I'm, you know, I'm very excited for our first live interview on Enter the Poserverse. When I'm flying in a plane or I'm on the street, there's a lot of famous people that I like to meet. They shake my hand and never ask my name, and they start asking questions that are always the same. Hey. All right, I'm very excited to welcome uh, today's guest into the Poserverse, the author of Violets, the new graphic novel, which you can find on Comixology this very second uh, into the stream, Mr. Sabir Prasada. Hey, thanks for having me. Yeah. So uh, the first thing that I want to do while we get to know you as an author and eventually we'll talk about violets. I know when I started reading it, I, I did not recognize your name, right? I looked at it and I was like, I don't know who this guy is. And then I got to the creator bios on the back and I was like, ah, oh, crap, this guy has professionally worked on a lot of different things. So, uh, for, since I'll spoil that for other people that you are quite the accomplished writer, uh, in, in TV and media, in addition to comics, uh, can you give the the audience an, a brief rundown of who you are inside the media world? Sure. Yeah, no. And I know that there is sort of a bit of a trend out there where you have TV writers who kind of come in with a comic that they have. And that comic is basically this sort of thinly veiled storyboard for them to try to turn around and go right back to Hollywood and try to, try yeah. to sell their pilot idea, which is really what it is. Uh, and I want to be upfront and say that I am not that person. I mean, for me, comics is my first love and it is my true love. And I've actually been trying to 
write comics for longer than I've been doing television. And the reason that I've got more TV credits and I'm known more for my TV work than in comics is partly because comics is just a longer enterprise in terms of having the resources and the time necessary to produce it. Um, and that can be challenging in a lot of ways. Whereas in TV, as for me as a TV writer, like that's more Warner Brothers' headache. That's more Disney's headache, like the, in terms of actually <laughs> the production challenges. I'm just the guy who writes the scripts. Uh, and so that's why I've been able to sort of rack up more credits in, in the TV world at this time. So, yeah, I mean, in the, in the realm of television, I've written on such shows as Person of Interest, uh, which was a uh, crime show that, that was on CBS from, I think, the years of 2011 to 2015. Um, I also wrote on a show called The Crossing, which was a time travel show that, that was on ABC. Uh, God, when was this? 2018, I think. Um, and then I wrote on season one of Roswell, New Mexico, which is still on the CW now for people who are interested in that. Um, and there's a couple of other TV projects that I would, I'm like dying to tell you about, but I've signed an NDA and it's, it's, uh, I just can't talk about it at this time, but. Uh, will, will you promise that once they become public, you'll let me get a little taste? Oh, of... absolutely. Yeah. Sounds good. Perfect. So, so, uh, what, what initially brought you to comics as kind of your preferred medium of expression? Yeah, I mean, for me, it was sort of a, a slow progression of just getting into comics in general, where it's like I started with cartoons as my gateway drug in terms of, you know, the X-Men, Spider-Man, Batman, the animated series. And then as an expansion, my interest in, in those cartoons, I think I'm speaking your language, yeah, um, that, that brought me to comics. Um, and it wasn't really until I was visiting uh, some family in India where there we had sort of rolling blackouts and some weather issues that kind of had us hunkered down in my cousin's apartment and my cousin had this giant comic book collection there and that was when i really got immersed in the possibilities of how you've had these stories that have sprawled for decades and decades and all kind of fit into these larger continuities and what a rich world it was to explore um and in addition to just kind of falling in love with the artwork the idea that i could tell a story in collaboration with an artist who could really you know take the ideas but then bring it to life through their own hands um, was something that was really exciting to me. And so comics was actually the first thing I attempted to do in the realm of storytelling before I ever tried screenwriting. Nice. What was the transition like from the comic collaboration process where it's normally you, an artist, and probably a colorist, where you get more of your freedom since the publisher greenlights the idea from the beginning versus the world of television where the just the circle of influence and the bureaucracy is much bigger like what's that creative difference like yeah i mean they're first of all they're definitely different mediums or second of all there's definitely different processes where they do overlap is that like you said they're both collaborative right even though i may have more control over the story in the realm of comics because i don't really have to answer to a studio a network non-writing producers and my showrunner uh in the realm of comics, you're still your your vision is still being filtered through the artistry of other people, such as your artist and your uh, colorist and even your letterer as well. Um, so that's sort of where they overlap in the sense that comics actually prepared me for the collaborative process mm, and being nice. open to changes and being open to people contributing ideas from any direction and being able to run with it and not take it personally when they have a better vision for for what what something may manifest and learn to let go of, of certain things where it's like you may have imagined it a certain way but if it turns out this way then you honor that and you run with what the new version of it exists pretty cool um and you kind of alluded to the way you got into comics uh i fell in love with comics again the same way that i've been back in the game for the first time since high school across the last year and i've discovered all of these amazing just collaborative stories that i have gotten into art much, you know, much better and seen the power of how that kind of wakens the imagination versus just, you know, reading a book or having the interpretation of art dictated to you when you're watching, you know, film or, you know, cartoon based media. So what kind of stuff do you like to read in terms of comics, graphic novels, any literature today? What's your free time kind of pleasure read? Oh, good question. I mean, I do think my taste has probably expanded in a way that it has for a lot of people, which is like when you first start out reading, you're reading your favorite superhero characters, then you start to pay attention to the writers and the artists whose work you're gravitating towards within mm -hmm. those. And then you tend to follow those creators as they go on to do other things. In terms of like the things that I'm gravitating towards right now, I mean, there's, there's so much out there. 
um, you know, the, the, the gothic horror stuff from the 80s, like Alan Moore's Swamp Thing or mm -hmm. Sandman or Constantine. There's a lot of those things that are sort of gaps in my comic book memory that I'm just now filling in. You know, um, Ed Brubaker and Sean Phillips' crime comics, I'm a big fan of right now on the sci-fi side. You know, anything by Warren Ellis is something I'm going to find really engaging. I'm, I'm a giant fan of Brian K. Vaughn and Jonathan Hickman, um, both of who do a lot of stuff that's, you know, inside the mainstream publishers and far outside of it, too. So Nice. And again, you see me nodding the whole time because like you were speaking my language with cartoons, you named off. I think of everything on that list, I have not read uh, Brewbreaker and Phillips on Criminal yet, and that's a wrong that I am getting ready to quickly address. Um, so of all of the projects that you've done from comics to, to television to anything in between, uh, how does the process of creating one project kind of inform how you approach other projects down the road? Yeah, I mean, you try to take everything you learn from one project and try not to repeat the mistakes of the past as, as you move into the next one. I mean, what's been nice for me is being able to cross over back and forth between comics and TV is that like, as a TV writer, you do it enough times, you start to get an ear for the types of lines of dialogue you write that don't always make it to the final cut because eventually you're gonna be over on time and you're gonna be in post-production. You're, you're gonna strip things down to the bare essentials of just what you need. And once you start to hone your ear for that, you can start to write to it to begin with. And that for me was a really good training ground for going back into comics because in comics, you only have so much space on a page and you really have to be targeted about the words that you're using. And so I found that that, that experience was useful. Now on the other side of things, the reverse side, I should say, um, from comics going into television, like writing for comics, you basically get to be the writer, the director, kind of the director of photography also, and your camera operator, because you're somewhat, not necessarily dictating, but you are providing a, a blueprint for what the shots could actually be visually in the frames, in the panels, and across the panels. Um, and that's something that kind of lends itself to a parallel experience with the camera. And it forces you to kind of think about what, you're, what it is you're going to see and how that tells a story, and also what's not on the panel. What's just outside the panel if there's a character within that same sort of space? And it, it gives you a sort of spatial awareness that you can work with that I think has sort of served me well in both mediums, whether it is comics or whether it is television. Um, and then it's kind of a constant push and pull from there in terms of sort of figuring out how much is too much. How do I not repeat myself with every story that I'm telling and push myself to do new things I haven't done before? Uh, and I think, you know, even Kevin Smith can sort of attest to when he sort of transitioned from his work in film to when he wrote yeah. Daredevil. You know, he had it was it was quite a verbose uh, run on the run on that that story, and I think he's he's kind of owned up to that to be like, oh, I needed, there was a process here which I needed to learn what what fits on the page and what doesn't. So, yeah, I, can speak I to just that. read I just read his Hit Girl in Hollywood run, and it was the the wordiest Hit Girl <laughs> I've read thus far. So, <laughs> ooh, I love the guy, but that was a lot of reading. Uh, <laughs> the last question I'll I'll ask you before we move to talking about specific comics. Uh, what kinds of passions, hobbies, uh, obsessions do you have outside of your own creative ventures as a writer? Oh, that is a great question. Uh, honestly, I was sort of earnestly trying to do more travel and, and exploration across the globe for obvious reasons. Those plans have sort of fallen by the wayside for now. You know, I hope yeah. to get back to it eventually someday but yeah so in the meantime it's it's mainly just this stuff and, and trying to carve out time to to read books and try to tailor my reading so that's more balanced with nonfiction because you know i'm such a passionate fiction reader that that tends to just overtake everything else and i'm trying to sort of open myself up to to more nonfiction. no i was the other way around i only read nonfiction. was like i can't have fun with all of this make-believe stuff and boy was i wrong so maybe <laughs> Maybe after this, we'll we'll trade some nonfiction titles. Yeah, sounds great. All right. Uh, in terms of talking about some specific comics, do you remember what the first comic you either bought or read was? I do. Um, it was a Marvel comic. It was a team-up comic between Spider-Man, Storm, and Luke Cage. And they were facing off against a villain named Smokescreen. And Smokescreen was trying to get a bunch of high school kids to start smoking cigarettes. And it was very much an after school special kind of thing. Um, and it was probably very cheesy. Uh, you know, I probably wasn't aware of it at the time, 
but clearly it made an impression on me, not only because I read and collect comics to this day, but because I ran track in high school and I've never smoked a cigarette. So, you know, it worked. <laughs> Fair. Uh, was that a book you purchased? Do you still own it? Uh, I did not purchase it. I think I, I got it from a friend who was moving and sort of getting rid of some of his, his books and things like that. And no, I think it was it was unfortunately pinned in a pile underneath a giant encyclopedia and the cover ripped off. And, wow. you know, I've moved a couple of times since then. So it's just kind of been, been lost in the shuffle. Fair. Um, in terms of characters or series, which which ones hold kind of a special nostalgic place in your heart? Ooh, I mean, there's there's all kinds. Probably the stuff that's that's cl closely connected to the cartoons is always going to be there for me. I mean, for me, there's a character. The character of Daredevil is a character I constantly go back to, and I think part of that is because it, there's there's so much rich stuff that that's been built out of that character that it's sort of similar to Batman, but because he's not as popular as Batman, these mm -hmm. writers and artists got to take bigger swings with him and really dig into his personal life in a, in a way that I found very three dimensional and very interesting. Um, so that's a character that I constantly go back to and am fascinated by. Uh, in terms of series, I mean, one of the comics that, for me, I've sort of marked a transition period for me in the types of stories that I was reading um, was Why the Last Man by Brian K. Vaughn. And I think the monkey had a big part to do with it. I just found the monkey so <laughs> endearing um, that that is something that, that it's it's always going to hold a special place in my heart. Nice. Um, no, God! No, God, please, no, 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 no. Uh, so I'm going to ask you the flip side of the question you just answered. Is there a popular uh, character or series that you loathe or you just can't get the hype behind them? Yeah, I mean, I think there are two. So one of them is a character that I used to have a great fondness and passion for, but over the years, I just kind of lost interest in that character. And that character is Venom the Spider-Man villain who at some point they kind of transitioned into turning him into an anti-hero who's a star of his own series. And boy, does he look cool, but I just don't have the same passion to explore what, what Venom is up to as I used to. And that's no disrespect to the creators involved. You know, perhaps I should give it another shot at some point. Um, and then the other character is uh, Deadpool, which is, you know, I understand that he has a lot of really hardcore fans and, and, that it can be a humorous character who breaks the fourth wall in, in, a, in a very unique and interesting way. But it's for whatever reason, it just hasn't been my, my cup of tea. So, uh, I, I agree with you, I think, on both of those. I've, I'm reading both current runs, and uh, Donny Cates is writing Venom now, and it's okay, but it's the same kind of Venom stuff. I think you should check out Kelly Thompson's new run of Deadpool, Okay. Only because okay. it prominently features a character named Jeff the Shark, which he's he's adorable, and they're making an action figure out of him, and that's the first action figure I will purchase from my uh, local shop. Oh, very cool. Great, yeah. Uh, last question uh, in terms of you as a fan, reader, or collector of comics, what what are your grail books? What are the ones that you would die to have in your collection? Oh man, there's, I'm sure there's, there's so many to name. Um, the, the, the three books that I go to that are just like the most beloved to me that I, that I would hate to ever lose. One is, it's a book written by Warren Ellis, illustrated by John Cassidy. It's called Planetary. And I think it's an absolute masterpiece of, of crazy ideas that shouldn't fit together, but they do. You know, every character has its own rich history and is full of surprises as the story progresses. The action is epic. Every issue feels so distinct from the previous issues, and yet it's all of a piece. Like to me, planetary is the definition of cool. Um, the, uh, of course, going to classics, you know, for me, From Hell by Alan Moore and Eddie Campbell is the scariest thing I've ever read. Um, I also think it's a master class on, on comic storytelling. It's something I've, I've gone to to study in terms of how, how best to tell a story on the page. Um, and then uh, just, just throw a sort of a wild card in there. Um, I'm not the biggest manga reader. However, there is uh, a manga series that Dark Horse has translated, and it's called Blade of the Immortal. And it ran, I think, 31, maybe 32 volumes, something like that. But for whatever reason, that one has really broken through to me, and it's, it's been a huge inspiration and influence on me through the years. Nice. All right. Now, for the real reason you are here, uh, I was lucky enough to read your new graphic novel, Violets. Uh, so what is the source of inspiration behind the story? 
Oh, well, thank you for reading it. Um, Violence sort of came out of me finishing my first book called Affliction, which was more of like an action book with a loosely held together sci-fi premise. And I wanted to challenge myself to do something that was totally different in a different genre. And that was a bit more meditative. Um, and I just had this personal experience, which I'm not going to go too much into. But what came out of that was wanting to explore this question that I think a lot of people have in their own lives, which is, you know, what is that experience when you have feelings for somebody? And does that does that experience speak more to the person that you have feelings for, or is it more indicative of how you view yourself? And as I was forming this idea, um, I was driving by a field of violet flowers or what looked like violet flowers. It was right off the freeway. And it is a field I have not ever been able to find since. And I've driven on that road um, well, quite a few times since then. And I remember thinking about, well, what does it mean when we have this sort of this Valentine's Day ritual where you buy flowers and you give them to somebody? Are you buying, trying to buy that person's love? Like what, what is the real significance behind what that, that custom is? Um, and so sort of combining all those elements was the genesis of the concept of violence. Nice. Now, without spoiling the end, but I think I know the answer to this question. Is there a potential for a follow-up, a second installment? I mean, okay, so never say never. Um, is there potential? Yes, there's, but there, I'm sure there's potential. There, there's two ideas for myself that I did not get to fully explore in the book that I wish I had the, the chance to do. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, I think there's, there's a possibility, but it's not really top of mind for me right now. And the graphic novel is very much designed to be a closed ended thing where you can read in one sitting, you can get a complete beginning, middle and end. And I sort of like that model. I like letting it kind of live in the mind of the reader after that. So. You know, yeah. who knows the line, but for right now, I think this is all I want to tell for this world. And when I got when I got done with it, my wife asked me a question. I was like, I got to let this process for a minute because I think you do a good job of kind of exploring the notion of, of feelings and where exactly the line might be. So I think, you know, that's a, a good plan of letting it sit in everybody's mind for a while and kind of have your own cathartic moment of you know, why do you go through the motions or have you, uh, you know, gone a bridge too far? Uh, while I ask you the next question, I'm going to show some of the art from the book uh, because I'm interested in knowing how you met up with the rest of the creative team. Yeah, so uh, this is the same creative team behind the, the previous book that I did called Affliction, um, and it's illustrated by Eliseo Govea. Um, I know him as by his nickname, which is Zeu. Uh, he had sent me some samples online alongside many other artists. Um, and while there were a lot of talented artists that I wanted to work with, there was something about the way that he uses curves in his lines that kind mm -hmm. of guides the reader through the page in a way that made me feel like I was kind of gliding. I felt like I was the perfect fly on the wall. And that was something that sort of made him a sort of stand out. Um, and so we've, we've had a, a long collaboration ever since. Uh, now, with respect to the colorist, Juha Velti, um, you know, I, I was asking to certain colors if they were comfortable sort of doing a bit of a sample page for me. And this was for the previous book, Affliction. Mm -hmm. And there was one page that had um, leaves falling off of a tree. And there was something about the way that Juha approached it, where it, even though that was an action book, he didn't have a flashy action style. He had his own style, which was something I really respected. Um, not only that, but there was something about the way that he colored it that was allowing me to get a sense of season out of it. Um, you know, where I could almost feel the wind blowing on the page. And I thought that was something really special and something I wanted to explore more. Um, and so, and I just felt like the, the two of them, like the, the harmony that they have in terms of, you know, Juha bringing, bringing colors to the work that Zeo was able to do, it really felt like it was something special. So um, that's how I kind of came across them. Yeah, and like I mentioned while we were making sure the stream set or was working, that this page was probably my favorite of, of the two. And I really think you get, you know, some sense of seasonality with kind of this harvesty color in the background, right? The, you talk about the, the leaves blowing in the wind in a, in an action book and just kind of watching uh, these two characters disintegrate. I think it's, it's quite beautiful. Um, so I know that there are some comic writers that when you write the script for your book, that some people give very heavy details in terms of description of what you want panels to look like. And then there are some folks who give 
you know, maybe a two sentence explanation and then hope and pray the, the artist and the colorist can nail it. What kind of, what, how do you approach giving insight to your uh, author or your artist and colorist? So I've actually tried all kinds of different types of approaches. All the things that you mentioned kind of were in violets at different pages and different stages. Um, what I have found works the best for a variety of artists is actually less is more, is, is to just convey, here's the plot, here are the important beats that we need to hit, here's how I see them laying out, but don't not necessarily being overly descriptive and giving the artist the freedom to say, okay, if that's the goal, here's how I'm going to accomplish the goal on the page and let them run wild with it and then see what comes back and then be involved with them at, at every stage, whether it is penciling before you get to inks or just the rough thumbnail layouts um, and saying, okay, this is cool. I see it this way. Um, wonder if, you know, we cut out this last panel and, and give more space to the previous panel uh, if we can get across the same idea and I can adjust the words accordingly. So making it a conversation that doesn't end with just me handing over the script but actually an ongoing process, one in which you really respect the freedom of the artist has yielded the best results for me. Is that something that you kind of grew into over time? Because what Affliction was five issues and then you have the same team here. Was it easier to kind of trust the team since you've worked with them on so many individual projects? Absolutely. There was definitely a shorthand that we developed to the point where I would even say, remember when we did this thing in Affliction, maybe we'll try it this way this time, but similar idea, similar but different, you know? Um, so definitely developing an ongoing relationship with your collaborators uh, can go a long way. And it, it was something I learned over time, which is to kind of pull back a little bit on the description um, and just kind of let the artist take the reins as best they can. Okay, uh, I'll, I'll be honest, I haven't read Affliction yet that, you know, when I was clicking on other works by you on Comixology, I saw that I could get all five issues for like, six bucks which i think is a hell of a deal and i think all of you when this is done should go to comiXology and not just pick up violets which is a 60 page graphic novel for two bucks but you should then give severe more of your money and go ahead and buy affliction uh but you've mentioned affliction is an action story how how do we get a different sampling of you when we read affliction versus reading violets yeah, I mean, in my eyes, they really could not be more different. I mean, Affliction is a fast-paced action book, and it's about a man who is sort of cursed with this problem. And that, that problem is that anybody who comes near him suddenly drops dead. And quickly, he is caught in a battle between these opposing forces who want to use this cursed ability for their own ends. And because that main character, he hardly has any choices at all to make in the story, it is functioned by design, for the most part, to be a roller coaster. You know, it, it looks and feels that way. And Violets to me is sort of the opposite in that it's all about the choices that Alder is given. It's the burden of choice. If you could force somebody to love you, would you do it? Should you do it? Um, and so while the creative teams are the same and you know the, there, are, there are similarities in the fact that they both have this singular narrator kind of taking you through his life, um, mm -hmm. you know, to me, they're, they're wholly different and, and I would not be surprised if, if they end up having different audiences altogether. Nice. Um... There are some books that I buy, read it once and put it in my bin or leave it in a folder and I'm not going to read it again. But there are some books that I know when I'm in the mood to read them again. So I read Violets once with a fresh set of eyes. I read it a second time to take some notes. So I made sure I didn't either miss story plots or spoiled anything in the review that I'll publish uh, today, What you know tomorrow today, since this is airing on Saturday. Uh, so if I were picking this up for a non-academic style read, a true second read for my stack, what kinds of things should I keep an eye out for? Uh, if, you, if you end up reading it for, for another time, I would suggest taking a look at the background details in the greenhouse sequence. And I think paying attention to some of those things may inform one's interpretation of the events in, in the story. Um, and I would also say just keep an eye out for color and look at how color is used in every scene and ask, is this color uh, meant to be a reflection of the character's mood is it, or is it something else? Is it sort of meant to challenge the character? Is it meant to guide us just through the tone? I think color, the, the colors did a really interesting job of kind of using it sort of intentionally as a storytelling tool. Okay. Um, 
I know that there is a fierce divide between people who are fans of physical books versus digital books. Uh, I myself lean a little bit more in the direction of physical books that I, I need that new book smell, uh, as you may be familiar with. Uh, I know that Affliction, that I found the trade online through the original publisher, uh, is there a plan to potentially do a print run of Violets, or will it stay on Comixology? Uh, I'm asking myself that same question, and, and I agree with you. I, I, my reading pile at this point is split pretty 50-50 between digital and print, um, but there is something special about being able to hold the story in your hands and the experience of literally being able to turn a page to mm -hmm. discover what's on the next page. I, I have not yet been able to see that be fully replicated in a digital format, uh, and I would love to bring that to Violets. Uh, the truth is, at the moment, we're just trying to see how the digital run does, and then kind of assess from there to say, is there a realistic demand to do a print run? And if so, what does that look like? And what's the volume of that and, and things like that and go from there. So uh, it's something I have an eye towards doing, but we're just not there yet right now. I'm just gonna try to focus on the digital run. And I bet it's hard probably printing something now in the midst of, of COVID where there are all kinds of delays and backups and distribution nightmares. So yeah, I, I bet that's probably tricky too. All right. When you were talking about the fact that you have some TV projects that you have held fairly close to your chest because of an NDA, do you have any new comic projects that you can talk about that you can share? Or are we in the same kind of I've signed papers and can't talk about it because I don't want to pay corporate overlords big, big money? Uh, no, in the realm of comics, there there is uh, another comic that I'm working on right now. It is an anthology comic, um, so it'll be a collection of short stories that are all connected in one continuity. I can tell you that it is set in the future. I can also tell you that it is set in the skies. Um, and it, there's been a lot of really interesting artists who sort of come on board for, for different stories. One of them, uh, his name is Martin Morazzo. He's done a book called Ice Cream Man, which I'm a really big mm -hmm. fan of at Image Comics. He's done two stories for me. Um, another artist, her name is Vanessa Del Rey, is involved. Um, she's done a book called Redlands, uh, as well as The Empty Man. Um, okay. And then there's another, there's another story by a very talented artist named Thomas Campy, who did a graphic novel all about Joe Schuster. So if, if one wants to learn about uh, the real story about one of the creators of Superman, I highly recommend checking out his graphic novel. It's, it's very, very good. Um, on that to, to put in the, the notes on YouTube, because yeah, I'm familiar with the good. first two, but I... I most definitely want to find a, a Joe Schuster graphic novel. I think that would be some some interesting reading. Oh, definitely. Um, I highly recommend it. The last thing that I want to talk about that with everybody I've interviewed on the blog, uh, I ask questions about kind of the comic community that we've found really, really cool, you know, people that care about helping people find books to read. And then we found, you know, the old school like comic book guy from the Simpsons who only wants to hate on everything that we've seen. Um, so who are some of your favorite folks to read or follow online, either talking about comics or the media world in general? Uh, well, on the comic side, there's a podcast called the Word Balloon Podcast, which I'm a really big fan of that John Suntress has been doing for a long time. Um, you know, there's another podcast that's not about comics, but it's called the movie film podcast by Zucky Hassan and, and Brian Hall, which I'm a really big fan of as well. Uh, that's where kind of where I get my movies fix. Um, as far as websites go, there's, there's comic book resources, there's comic crusaders. And of course, very excited to tell everybody about the, the amazing work that you're doing as well. Oh, I, I appreciate that. I just started reading and watching the comics crusaders guys, the, the comics crusaders international podcast and they have just been blowing my mind in terms of all of the history that all three of those guys share and kind of break things down. So I'm a big fan of them uh, as well. Uh, what has been your coolest interaction with a fan of your work, a collaborator who you've worked with, a fellow creator, like give me your best either fanboy or fan appreciation moment. Oh, that's a great question. 
Uh, well, was, with respect to fans, it was always a very special experience for, for those of us who worked on Person of Interest to go to Comic-Con, share the new stuff that we were working on for the upcoming season, and meet the fans there who had sort of gathered and waited in line to to see what we had to share. And that, that's, that was a special experience that, that I'll always look at fondly. Um, I mean, with respect to, you know, meeting other creators, you know, I, I have participated in something called the Comic Creator Connection. I don't know if you've heard of that. It's, mm -hmm. it's a program that WonderCon and San Diego Comic-Con both have where literally a writer and an artist, you basically speed date a bunch of other fellow collaborators looking to make comics. And it was such a special experience to get to have FaceTime with these people, um, share with them the stuff that you're excited about. They share with you their their samples. Um, and, and that is an experience that cannot really be replicated online in quite the same way, yeah. you know? And so it, I do lament the fact that we haven't been able to, to do that as much this year because of the state of the world. And I, I hope we're able to get back to doing that. Um, and then as far as meeting other people that I'm a big fan of, you know, I was lucky enough to have a job working in the mailroom at CAA, which was, you know, a, a Hollywood agency that re represents, you know, writers, actors, directors, all these people. So you've got, you know, famous people come walking in and out of those, those elevators all the time. Um, and one time Neil Gaiman walked out of the elevator and I had to kind of do a double take. I was like, was that really Neil Gaiman? And it was him and he was walking with Amanda Palmer and, you know, I ran up to him and then told him what a huge fan I was of the Sandman. And uh, he was very nice and, and gave me a little shout out on Twitter that same day. So Nice. I. I like asking that question because it's nice to know that people of any level of fame or notoriety always has their moment of like, oh my God, that's this person. And you have your freak out and then like straighten out your shirt, fix your hair at cool moments. So that's pretty awesome. Yeah. Um, the, the last question I have is uh, a lot of people that I interact with on Twitter, uh, especially when I'm looking at indie work, are first-time creators or people who are new to the review game like myself. So what kind of advice would you have for someone who is looking to get their foot in the door of comics, graphic novels, film, TV, whatever? Uh, I would say two things. The first thing is to stay passionate, which is that no matter where you are in terms of progressing the quality of your work, your passion can always be communicated and it will always connect to somebody else. So find a way to get that across um, and share your excitement with others. Uh, the other thing I would say is it's, it's, it was very useful to me to build a network of peers, of like-minded individuals who don't necessarily need to like all the exact same things, but who do have similar goals, whether that is you know writing reviews or whether that is creating new content, if that's comics, if that's something else, whatever it is, you can hold each other accountable. You can use each other as a safe space to get feedback from one another um, and give each other encouragement. I mean, what we do in terms of telling stories, it can be a lonely endeavor at times, but it doesn't have to be. Um, and there's a lot of strength that comes from the community element. And, and that requires not necessarily being shy. It requires putting yourself out there and, and trying to connect with others who may appear to be strangers at first. But I think there's there's great value in doing that. Awesome. Uh, well, I want to say thank you so very much for uh, allowing me to do my first awkward interview with someone via uh, my faulty internet in the great state of Kansas. Um, I want to tell everybody that you most definitely uh, should check out uh, Sabir and the rest of his art team's newest creation in Violets that I think it's a, a mind-blowingly powerful story that will get you thinking but not in a way that is super depressing of all of these, you know, self quarantined, you know, in, in times of being imposed in your own home or a prisoner in your own home that it's, it's definitely think something I think you should read. And if you read it and you go, Hey, it's not for me, you're only investing $2 in the book instead of, you know, buying a $20 hardcover trade or something like that. So I want to say thank you. Do you have anything else you would like to, to say with uh, the viewers? I just want to say thank you so much for, for everybody's uh, interest and time. And, and thank you so much for, for hosting me. It's been really great to chat. Yeah, likewise. All right. All right. Uh, I want to thank all of you for tuning in to today's episode of Enter the Poseverse. Um, let me know down in the comment section what you think about the, the kinds of questions that I asked during the interview. Are there people out in the comic, graphic novel, manga, anime, whatever kind of community 
that you would like me to see try uh, to get an interview with or, you know, any kinds of tips or, or suggestions of things that you would like in the future. Uh, please, if you're interested in my content, you know, hit that like button, hit the, the subscribe button. Uh, remember here, once we, you know, hit the coveted 100 subscribers mark, which we are, you know, on that March to now, uh, I will have a contest to, to give away a variant cover, cover of Dark Knight's Metal number one. Uh, it's a Midtown variant cover, and it's quite badass. Uh, you can look at some other images on the channel or on Twitter or Instagram uh, to see what we've got going on. So thank you for stopping by, and have a good one.